All right, uh, good lord, we're going to talk about the wrestling again. I'm Garrett. We're here at Paste Magazine. I've got a friend, Elliot. Uh, I've known this man for decades. He is as an astute and observer of the one true art as anyone I have ever met. We used to do a show on uh, the radio. If you ever have lived in Athens, Georgia, there's a radio station there called WOG. We used to do a wrestling show on there about 20 years ago. Yeah, I guess it was in 2000 and. 2000, 2001, right 2000, around then? 2001. Yeah. I was in grad school, so, yeah. you know, focusing yeah, yeah. on pro wrestling. I was wrapping wrestling. up my, my undergrad, and yeah, I was the program director of WOG at the time, and uh, I thought, hey, why not put us on the air and talk about one of our favorite yeah. things to discuss? And that was a, an interesting time for wrestling. That was when WCW was obviously kind of dying off. WWE in 2000 had its biggest year ever. Remember that show we went to in Athens? Yes, uh, at, at Bumpers. Bumpers. Yeah, there was a pool in there. Yeah. There was uh, It was this redneck bar in the outskirts of Athens, had a mechanical bull, and we saw a show there, an NWA Wild Side show. Yes, it was like there was still a NWA territorial uh, thing going on and there was uh, they were doing shows in Cordelia and then they did one in, in Athens and we saw some pretty interesting characters that yeah that show had like looking back at that lineup today uh, only I think six Americans have won the IWGP title in New Japan and two of them were on that one show in, outside Athens in 2001 yeah we saw AJ Styles which was pretty crazy. I mean, he yeah. was a babyface, like super, super young guy at the time. And then Bob Sapp, who went on to be a massive star in Japan. Yeah, never really did a lot here stateside, but uh, he was in the longest yard. Uh, he well, was in the Adam Sandler longest yard. Yeah, well, yeah. that one certainly goes on the resume. Absolutely. But uh, hey, so we're not here to talk about the past. Well, we're here to talk about the recent past from last Saturday, not from 20 years ago. Um, yeah, AEW, baby. Yeah, AEW. They had their first uh, pay-per-view since launching the TV show on uh, last Saturday night, November uh, whatever day that was. Full Gear, live out of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, it was uh, definitely a wrestling pay-per-view. We're really only going to focus on a couple of the major matches right now. Um, starting off with the AEW World title match. Yeah, so this was a really fun show. Obviously, they've they've done some uh, some big shows, but this is the first pay per view that they've had since being on TNT. So it was a really big deal, and they've been building up to this uh, title match between Cody and Chris Jericho for a long time. And boy, they really over delivered on yeah. this. I, it was uh, you know high expectations going into the into the show. Um, you know those guys are 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 pros of the of the highest order i mean chris jericho is up there as you know maybe you know after what he's been doing here in AEW, maybe in the conversations like is this a top 10 wrestler of all time now just based on longevity you know it's i've just, honestly thought that for a long time yeah, frankly i mean, the, I mean like if, if he had been in a position where he was in a company that actually presented him in a better light for most of his career i think we would it would be no question for sure and his ability to to uh, be successful like in back in Smoky Mountain to ECW to WCW to his you know extremely long run in WWE over the years um, you know it's just you know he, he's a legend he's a god he's Chris Jericho um, and then to mix it up with Cody who arguably is the biggest baby face in all of wrestling right now yeah. it was uh, you know certainly high expectations going into this match um, but, but, but like I said they over delivered yeah they're both great athletes way. Uh, more importantly, they're both great storytellers. Like both of these two men understand how to tell a story both inside and outside the ring. And this match had a fantastic build. That, that last dynamite before the show that had Cody's promo of the decade um, and also had that amazingly hilarious video that Chris Jericho made. Yeah, I mean, I think the lead in was, you know, r really set it up. I mean, that promo that Cody cut on, on Dynamite the week before, what, what, that people are literally discussing this as, was this one of the greatest wrestling promos of all time? And the answer is quite possibly. Yeah. I mean, you know, to be a second generation wrestler and, you know, to have your dad be Dusty Rhodes, who is, you know, in the Mount Rushmore of, of, of great wrestlers, you know, uh, of all time and you know those expectations have got to be you know so difficult to live up to i mean even with uh you know your brother you know has, has been doing this for for a million years as well i mean yeah. you know it, to, to be able to translate all of that history um and 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 just synthesize it into one you know two minute promo to you know to to get this match over like yeah. he just did it in a way that was just you know absolutely mind-blowing and, and um, it really hammered home what is one of like the the the, the core uh 
tenants about AEW right now, which is this is a guy who grew up the son of a guy who probably knew more about wrestling than maybe anyone else alive uh, back when Dusty was around, um, who knew wrestling the way it was supposed to be done. And Cody grew up learning from him and then working for a company that intentionally limits what its performers are able to do in all aspects of the game. Yeah, it's really so here he is cutting this promo that is heavily about how um, AEW provides freedom to guys like him, and he proved that freedom by being able to cut a promo like this. Well, and and and, and then <laughs> Chris Jericho's, uh, you know, the, the vignette that they did, you know, that had had Virgil in it, it had you know his his fake what aunt's cousin or something, yeah, and there was a friend from yeah, church. Yeah, you know, it's just you know those guys are, you know. They have all this time and, and they're running loose and they're just, you know, getting so creative right now. It's just it, it's extremely refreshing. And, you know, all building up into this match where, you know, Jericho's got his muscle in, in, in Jake Hager and Cody brings his, you know, his, his buddy, MJF, his best friend, um, his, his protege. His friend. And then, um, you know, it, it set the table for a very exciting night. And, yeah. um, you, know, you know, we don't have to get into the. Well, you, you know, know what? I, I think there are two things really to talk about real fast. There's the match itself, which if you didn't see, uh, Chris Jericho won the match when Cody's friend MJF threw the towel in. Jericho had Cody in the lion tamer and was stomping on his head, which had already been busted open. Um, so Cody's best friend threw in the towel to end the match for him. But then also, maybe more importantly, after the match, there was the post-show angle, which is obviously going to be a major part of the company's direction going forward, where MJF, who initially it seemed like he was really conflicted about throwing in the towel to save his friend, uh, openly turned on Cody and revealed himself to be the heel that everyone has always known him to be. Which is something that I feel like people were expecting to happen sooner or later and maybe yeah. that like oh is this going to be the night that it was finally going to be happening because they've been doing uh you, you know mjf is positioned as like a a bad guy and but the, the one thing is that oh he's best friends with cody who's the most over baby face in the company so it's an odd dynamic and so you were just sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop and it finally yeah. did on, on on saturday and then you know we're we're, we're taping this on on a thursday and so the, the follow-up dynamite uh, happened and so now they're going full bore into this uh, Cody versus MJF feud yeah. and it's a great transition um, and, and really sets themselves up for like some great long term storytelling over the next few months and yeah. um, you know it, this feels like it could be like a great rivalry to take you you know through the fall into the winter I mean hopefully they have a series of matches um, you know they could just go so many different places yeah. I mean I, I you know we'll see and that's one of the exciting things is that you know you, you just uh you got two hot guys just going at going after it. Two and, of the uh, best promos in the yeah, business absolutely. who are going to be having legendary microphone battles. And last night on Dynamite, MJF, uh, they made a point of he's he didn't join Jericho's stable. He's not in the inner circle. He's just his own heel who now has his own heater, his own muscle in the form of Wardlow. Yeah, who, who I don't I think really know much to, about, but we like, have to say his name in all caps. I think. Yeah, um, yeah, sort of the Walter deal. Yeah, uh, or the Facebook deal. Um, and yeah, so that. You know, I'm just really excited to see where all this is going to go, but uh, but kudos to, to to Jericho and kudos to Cody for just yeah. uh, really putting it all out there, and uh, you know couldn't have been a more exciting match. So. Speaking of putting it all out there, the actual last match on the show, the lights out unsanctioned battle between John Moxley, the former Dean Ambrose, and Kenny Omega, um, was something we've never really seen, I don't think, on an American pay per view of this size. It was a legitimate death match, the kind that you would see in CZW or in some Japanese promotions. You had two men scraping each other with barbed wire, yeah. of crawling through broken glass. They had this, they called it a barbed wire spider web. It was clearly a hammock. This weird contraption made a barbed wire they both fell into near the end. Yeah, it, 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 it's funny. Like you mentioned, like, uh, you know, some of the, the hardcore promotions. I, like, when I was a teenager, I would find, like, bootleg VHS tapes of FMW that would have, uh, you know, Mr. Pogo and Onita and Terry Funk. And these were really crazy, gruesome matches. And I feel like, you know, you, you, you've heard interviews with John Moxley where he's like, I want to do, you know, a big Japan style match. I, I want to do, like, you know, bring these hardcore matches. Like, like the likes of which you've never seen to you know a bigger audience and and they gave it like their all I mean it's 40 minutes of just mm -hmm. brutality just um, escalating like yeah. spot to spot with like a, a new gimmick to completely try to carve themselves up with and you know 
in these matches, you normally get a lot of blood and guts. And the one thing that I will say about this is that, you know, in the beginning, like as they were dueling with their barbed wired bat and their barbed wired broom, uh, you were getting a lot of superficial damage like to the head and to the back and stuff. But you could see like the, the lines yeah, of blood still yeah. on the back. But what's crazy is that by the time you got to the end of this match, like a lot of that stuff, like you know, they just seem like some sweaty dudes. Yeah. Like it wasn't as gruesome as I feel like, you know, s some of these matches. It was know, a really safe type of death match. Like it wasn't as dangerous as it looked. Like uh, a lot of people were very disappointed in this match. They were angry that someone is technically gifted as Omega would feel the need to do something like this. But when you watch the match, like Elliot was just saying, uh, yeah, they would bleed from their back, but after like, a, you know, maybe a minute, like obviously the wounds would be healing up right there on the spot. Like it was a much less bloody match than the Cody Jericho match where Cody was just covered in for blood sure. for most of the for match. Sure. Or especially the Cody Dustin match for May at Double or Nothing. That was a gory bloodbath like we've rarely seen in America. And I think that it, it, it is exciting to see these matches, you know, maybe a couple times a year, yeah. you know, for a huge blow off to, to, to a major feud like this. Um, you know, I don't know if I want to see this every week, right? but uh, if done with the proper intensity with the right guys, like it could really make for, uh, you know, exciting viewing. And I think, you know, seeing Kenny Omega in that type of match where you traditionally don't see, you, you see him do those 60 minute, uh, you know, marathons with, with Okada or Tanahashi or, yeah. you know, Obushi or even now, you know, what he's been doing more recently here in AEW. Uh, it, he, he hasn't traditionally done those types of matches. So I, I think there was some novelty in that. But mm. now, um, again, referencing last night's Dynamite, you're seeing John Moxley, you know, he's going to be transitioning to a feud with Darby Allen, which I think is, is, is great. That's, that's going to be perfect for both of those guys. And yeah. then where Kenny goes, who knows? But uh, you know, now with with this feud under his belt, like I mean, he's done all these different styles. Now it's like he can really work with anybody, and it's really exciting. You know, and I for, think it was what the future is going to hold for him. That's part of why he wanted to do it was yeah. to prove, hey, I can do any kind of match. You know, yeah. and also a lot of people complained about the lack of storyline rationale for why these two guys would want to murder themselves so <laughs> thoroughly. I feel like they did a really good job of explaining that in the video package they showed before the match. And that's one thing that, that AEW is, is actually relying on a lot. It's it's the, the being the elite stuff. It's what they're doing on YouTube. It, it's it's not always just, you know, what you're seeing on the screen, you know, on Dynamite. Um, you know, they're utilizing Dark yeah. in, in a way to, to help accentuate these, uh, these feuds. You and, have to and watch and people, that weekly YouTube it, show Dark if you really want to follow everything and people that are super fans like are really gonna get it now I, I certainly feel like I probably could have used a little bit more of you know them telling the story like you know on dynamite to you know to to really make me feel the the intensity I mean obviously Moxley's promo before the pay-per-view was what was was fantastic but yeah. you know they're only six seven weeks into this uh, right you know, so so they're learning along the way but um, but so far so good um, yeah it was a it was something you've never really seen uh, no. for a match of this size in America, and that made it um, special. Basically, made it very memorable, um, and it ended with uh, Moxley defeating Omega. So Omega's semi losing streak continues. But we'll see what happens. I think he's going to be be fine going forward, as oh, since he's yeah. a he's one of the EVPs. But one of the last things uh, I wanted to touch on here was. Um, what they're doing with the women's division, there was a couple things that they that they had going on, uh, on on full gear. They did the Riho Emi Sakura match, which was excellent. They also did uh, the B Priestley Britt Baker match on the pre-show, and I thought both of those matches really did a great job of highlighting, um, you know. I won't say the depth of the women's division, but it definitely highlighted that there are some great stars and burgeoning, uh, you know, wrestlers to to really watch going yeah. forward. Uh, you know, having Awesome Kong come out and scout B Priestley after the match, you know, that's cool. And then they do do another one, uh, you know, on Dynamite last night. So I think that's something really exciting to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Kong is just, you know, she's a legend. She's one of the best ever, um, and to have her feature prominently, I think, is great. She brings that star power, which I think the division really, really needs. Um, there's a lot of great wrestlers out. Out there but a lot of them are unfamiliar to to an american audience like right. not all of us you know know everybody from stardom or shine or some of these other women's promotions um and there's some really quality talent out there and uh, i hope they just continue to uh to highlight some of these women because they're they're really really great and you know as wwe has has shown you can have um you know an incredibly deep 
female roster of talent and do really exciting things. NXT is going to be doing war games with all women coming right. up for the first time, which is really exciting. So I hope they continue to build that division because there's some great talent out there. Um, and I think just uh, as the show goes on uh, and we see these women more often, that I think it, it'll only be a positive. Yeah. You were hesitant to use the word depth when talking about the AEW women's roster. And I think it's more the unique constitution of it. Yeah. It may not be as deep as WWE's, but they have a lot of women with very strongly defined uh, roles, like like different styles of wrestling, For sure. um, different uh, types of characterization, uh, stuff like that, in a way that I feel like WWE sometimes a little bit... Um, uh, it hasn't been that good at so far. I think NXT is way better at giving you a variety of women in styles, whereas Absolutely. the main roster shows, it, it tends to be a little formulaic. Um, and AEW's done a really good job of building that roster. I mean, they've added some women to it recently, like Shauna from Portugal. Uh, Mercedes Martinez was on Dark again, who's She's great. great. I, really, I really hope they bring Mercedes in full time. And, you know, some of these women's situations, you know, some of them live in, in Australia or they live in Japan, so it's not easy for right. them to, to get over all the time. The travel is really, really difficult. Visa issues and all that stuff. I mean, uh, you know, there's a litany of, of reasons, but I, I think a few more familiar faces in the AEW uh, women's division would be uh, would be a great idea. But they're on the right track, and yeah. I think we're and, and with Kong and Brandy, what they're doing with them, it's actually it's it's giving an angle, it's giving a storyline sure. to the women's division, sure. where I mean, you have someone who is a certified. Uh, killer, like the Vader of American women's yeah. wrestling, uh, who's going to steamroll through to the division and who's going to be the one who, to stop her. You yeah. know? It'll be exciting to see. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, Elliot, thanks for stopping by. Hey, this has been a you. longer than expected, but a very entertaining hey, a and enjoyable talk about. talk about AEW. It's exciting times. Uh, we'll love to have you back in the future. Yeah, thanks absolutely. again for watching Paste. Have a great day.